Hello everyone. Uh, in this lecture, I'm going to discuss about pernicious anemia. Now, actually, some authors uh, say that pernicious anemia is the most common cause of vitamin B12 deficiency in the world. Okay. So it is supposed to be the most common cause. However, it's not very common in our part. Like in India, it's not very common. It is more common in Caucasian population in the Scandinavian regions. Okay. So it's more common in Caucasian population. It's a disease of elderly. Okay, the median age of diagnosis is 60 years and it is very uncommon in uh, people who are less than 30 years of age. Okay, so the median age of diagnosis is 60 years. But what is the mechanism? This is actually a kind of autoimmune disease in which the body will develop some autoreactive T cells. It will develop some autoreactive T cells against the gastric mucosal cells. Okay, so it will, uh, the body will generate some autoreactive T cells against the gastric mucosal cells that will cause mucosal injury, the gastric mucosal injury. And also, as a byproduct, they will produce some of the auto antibodies. Some of the auto antibodies. Now, we need to understand that though we study auto antibodies in more detail in patients, I mean, in this disease, in pernicious anime, we study in detail about the auto antibodies, but it is uh, thought that auto antibodies are not the cause for disease production, I mean, uh, for, for a disease initiation. For disease initiation or for the development of the disease, the autoreactive T cells are important. And the autoantibodies are actually byproduct of this reactive T cells. However, these autoantibodies will help us diagnosing this condition by, because uh, various uh, serological methods, we can actually identify these autoantibodies. This helps us in diagnosis, but this is not the sole pathogenic mechanism for the disease. Then uh, you must be thinking that uh, how these uh, autoreactive T cells are getting generated. But actually, uh, it is uh, hypothesized that uh, there are some kind of uh, genetic abnormalities that can lead to formation of these autoreactive T cells. But we exactly do not know what is those genetic abnormalities. Okay. Now, what happens in this condition? Uh, here, there are basically three types of autoantibody formation. Type 1, type 2, and type 3. The type 1 is otherwise known as blocking antibody this is otherwise known as blocking antibody and this is present in 75 percent of the patients with pernicious anemia okay so this is known as blocking antibody why it is known as blocking antibody because it is actually blocking the interaction between the intrinsic factor and vitamin b12 okay so this interaction is getting blocked interaction between intrinsic factor and vitamin b12 is blocked by this type 1 antibody which is present in 75 percent of the cases Okay. Now, type 2 antibodies, it is otherwise known as binding antibody. It is known as binding antibody. That means it will prevent, it will prevent the binding of intrinsic factor to the cubulin receptor. Or you can say the cubam receptor. Okay. Also, this receptor will have this amnionless complex. It will have this amnionless. Okay. So, this is known as binding antibody. This these two antibodies, type 1 and type 2 antibodies, these are actually somewhat specific for pernicious anime. These are somewhat specific. And these are found both in plasma. These are found both in plasma and gastric juice. These are found both in plasma and gastric juice. Now coming to the third type of antibody, that is the type 3 antibody. This type 3 antibody is actually against the alpha and beta subunits of alpha and beta subunits of H plus ATPH pump, H plus ATPH pump that is present in the parietal cells. Okay. So as I told you, parietal cells will produce intrinsic factor and also they will produce the hydrochloric acid. For this production of hydrochloric acid, they need this H plus ATPH pump and this pump has this alpha and beta subunits and this type 3 autoantibodies are detected against these subunits. Okay. Pepsin is produced by chip cells which I forgot to show in this image, so it is produced by the chip cells. Anyway, so type 3 antibodies are against the parietal cells. These are otherwise known as the anti-parietal cell antibodies. Okay. However, these type 3 antibodies, these are non-specific. These are non-specific. That means these antibodies are also found in other cases of atrophic gastritis. Okay. So any case of atrophic gastritis, this type 3 antibody is found. Okay, so it is not specific for pernicious anemia, but type 1 and type 2 antibodies are somewhat specific. 
Okay, this type three antibody is found in almost ninety percent of the patients with pernicious anemia. But as I have already told you, these are not specific. Okay. Actually, when I was telling you about the causes of B12 deficiency, I forgot to tell about one condition. I'll just mention that here. This condition has nothing to do with pernicious anemia, but because I forgot in the previous lecture, I'll just mention it here. There is a condition that is known as Immersland. Immersland Gressbeck syndrome. Immersland Gressbeck syndrome. Now, what is this Immersland Gressbeck syndrome? This happens because of mutation in this amniolase, okay? Or you can say AMN. Mutation in AMN gene or amniolase gene. This is an autosomal recessive condition. And this is associated along with vitamin B12 deficiency. This is associated with non specific proteinuria. Non specific proteinuria. Because this amniolase is also present in the renal tubules. This amniolase is also present in the renal tubules, which helps in protein reabsorption. Okay, so that is why if amniolase is mutated, it can also, along with B12 deficiency, it can also cause non specific proteinuria. So these are the important points about immersion and respect syndrome. Mutation in amniolase, autosomal recessive condition, and non specific proteinuria will be there. Okay, but again, I am emphasizing this has nothing to do with pernicious anime. This is another cause of B12 deficiency, which I forgot to tell in the previous lecture. Okay, so nothing to do with pernicious anime. Okay, now coming to the pernicious anime. So we have discussed about the autoreactive T cells, then the antibodies type 1, type 2, type 3, and I have told you these antibodies help in uh, diagnosis of pernicious anime. And uh, type 1 and 2 are specific, type 3 is non specific. It can be found in any condition of atrophic gastritis. Okay. Now we'll see the clinical features, morphology and clinical features. We have already discussed about the bone marrow, peripheral blood, and CNS findings. Okay. So in the basics of megaloblastic anemia, I have discussed about the bone marrow and peripheral blood findings. Okay. The same findings you are going to get here. And the CNS findings I have discussed in the, uh, when I discussed about the B2L metabolism, I have told you about the subacute combined degeneration. So those things will happen. So I'm not going to discuss them again. What extra is, uh, you are going to find in these patients with pernicious anemia? So what are the, what are the changes that you're going to see in the stomach? Okay. So as I have told you, there will be atrophic gastritis. So there will be gastric gland atrophy. So you are going to get gastric gland atrophy. Gastric gland atrophy, and uh, they uh, as they produce predominantly anti parietal cell antibodies, so parietal cells will be predominantly affected. Okay, and also you can find this gastric glands are somewhat atrophied. These are atrophied. Okay, and whenever there is gastric gland atrophy, the stomach will have something known as intestinal issue. Okay, so that is known as metaplasia. So whenever you find atrophic gastritis, there will be metaplastic changes in the stomach mucosa. There will be metaplastic changes, and now the stomach mucosa will start having this goblet cells. These are known as the goblet cells. These are the goblet cells. Goblet cells are usually found in the intestine. But if the patient develops atrophic gastritis, there will be metaplastic change. And now you can see this goblet cells in the stomach or gastric mucosa. This is known as intestinalization. Again, this is not specific for pernicious anemia. This can be seen in any patient with atrophic gastritis. Again, we'll discuss more on this when we we'll discuss about the GA, GA pathology. And whenever there is intestinal lesion, whenever this metaplastic change happens, there is always increased risk of stomach adenocarcinoma. Always increased risk of stomach adenocarcinoma. Okay, so pernicious anemia is actually a pre-cancerous condition. It can actually lead to adenocarcinoma because of this intestine, and, uh, intestine metaplasia. Okay, so these are the changes, morphological changes that are going to happen in the stomach. And again, there is one more morphological change, which is very important to remember here. These epithelial cells, the stomach and the gastric epithelial cells will also show this megaloblastic changes. They will also show megaloblastic changes. That means their nucleus will have, they will have defective nucleus. Like what we have discussed for, uh, uh, during the process of erythropoiesis, they will have megaloblastic changes. Similarly, here, in this gastric epithelial cells, they will also have this, uh, because of this defective nuclear maturation, they will have megaloblastic changes. Okay. So I have told you previously, the B12 will predominantly go to the bone marrow and to the GI epithelial cells. Okay. So they will have predominant megaloblastic changes inside the bone marrow and also in the GI epithelial cells. Okay. So these findings also you are going to see. These are the morphological changes that are going to happen inside the stomach. Apart from that, they can also have some, again, some non-specific findings like atrophic glossitis. So this is atrophic 
atrophic glossitis. The tongue will become sining, sining, biffy red, sorry, biffy red, sining biffy red. That is atrophic glossitis. Again, atrophic glossitis is very non-specific for finding. It can be seen in various other vitamin deficiency. And also it is, we have discussed that in patients with iron deficiency anemia also, we can get this atrophic glossitis. Okay. They uh, can also sometimes develop this uh, lemon yellow tinge in the skin. So lemon yellow tinge of skin, especially the facial skin. I mean, this is not specific for pernicious anemia. This can be seen in uh, any patient with vitamin B12 deficiency. Okay. Um, I mean, atrophic loss is uh, this lemon yellow tinge of the skin. And we also discussed that this, the patient can also develop gray hair. Gray hair. Only hair grain can, can be seen. And also these patients can also develop a very interesting finding. It's a very interesting finding that we see clinically is knuckle hyperpigmentation. Knuckle hyperpigmentation. Knuckle hyperpigmentation. Okay. So these are other clinical findings that you can find in patients with B12 deficiency. Again, these are not specific for pernicious anime. This can be seen in any patient with B12 deficiency. So if you summarize, what are the things we are going to find in patients with B12 deficiency? We are going to find the bone marrow changes, peripheral blood changes, anemia, and you will also send, uh, find the CNS changes. Apart from that, you are also going to get this atrophic glossitis, lemon yellow tinge of the skin, gray hair, and knuckle hyperpigmentation. These are the cutaneous manifestations that we are going to find in patients, any patient with B12 deficiency. Okay. Apart from that, patients with BTL deficiency can also uh, you can also find megaloblastic changes in the GI epithelial cells. Okay, so these are the common findings whenever there is BTL deficiency. The only extra thing in pernicious anemia that you are going to find is this glastic gland atrophy and intestinalization leading to increased risk of adenocarcinoma. These are the extra points that you are going to find in patients with pernicious anemia. Okay, apart from that, other findings you are going to get in any patient with BTL deficiency. Okay, so if I summarize again, you are going to get one more findings. We are going to get peripheral blood findings, including anemia, and whatever we have discussed, macro oversight, hyperspinate segment, and neutrophils, all those things we are going to get. CNS, we are going to get this subacute combined indigenous no spinal cord, peripheral neuropathies, and uh, dementia, so all those things we are going to get. And in the mucocutaneous manifestations, you can remember the atrophic glossitis, lemon yellow tinge of the skin, gray hair, knuckle hyperpigmentation, and also in the GI epithelial cells, we will get the megaloblastic changes. So these are all the findings you are going to get in vitro deficiency, any cause of vitro deficiency. The extra thing that you are going to find in patients with pernicious anemia is the glastic gland atrophy leading to metaplastic changes leading to the increased risk of adenocarcinoma. Okay, that is why in these patients, when you treat these patients with vitamin B12, the megaloblastic changes will reverse. Okay, so in the gastric mucosa, the megaloblastic changes that has happened, it will reverse with the vitamin B12 therapy. However, the metaplastic changes will not reverse. The metaplastic changes will not reverse, and the risk of adenocarcinoma risk of adenosia is not reversed. These are not reversed because these things are not because of vitamin B12 deficiency. These things are because of the atrophic uh, gast gastritis, which is happening because of the autoimmune T cells. Okay, so these autoimmune related changes will not reverse with B12 therapy. The megaloblastic change will reverse. Okay, and how can you treat these patients? Because there is def defective absorption, we can give parental B12. And many of the patients with B12 deficiency, we actually treat them with parental B12 therapy. However, as I have told you previously, high dose of oral B12 therapy can also be given because the passive absorption mechanism is still will still be normal. And if you give high dose of oral butyl, that will that will also be effective in patients with pernicious anemia. Okay. So this is about pernicious anemia. The last thing is what are the associations? It can also be associated with other autoimmune dis disorders like type 1 diabetes mellitus, vitiligo, vitiligo, and thyroid disorders and thyroid disorders. Okay. So these are the other autoimmune disorders. This Pernicious anemia can be associated with, and also it can be associated with H. pylori infection. H. pylori infection. These are all the associations of pernicious anemia. Okay. So this is all about the vitamin B12 metabolism deficiencies and the pernicious, uh, and the causes including the pernicious anemia. And I have also told you about a very interesting condition that is known as Emerson Gresbeck syndrome, which is caused by the mutation in amnionless, okay, or AMN gene mutation. It is an autosomal recessive condition due to non-specific proteinuria. Okay, it is uh, usually it is very co commonly found in children in the western uh, areas. Okay, and again I will emphasize that this disease, Emerson Gresbeck syndrome, has nothing to do with pernicious anemia. Okay, it has nothing to do with pernicious anemia. Okay, 
so that is uh, all about this lecture in the next lecture we will discuss about the polycase metabolism and its deficiencies